Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders viewable through M. Oppenheim TV and YouTube. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing American veterans and the network of support that they deserve with our special guests, Joseph Van Fonda, Sergeant Major of the U.S. Marine Corps, retired, and CEO of the Disabled Veterans National Foundation, and Robin Kelleher, CEO and co-founder of the Hope for the Warriors in Virginia. Thank you both for joining us. I really so appreciate your being here, and I appreciate the services that you provide to everyone who has served our country. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity to be on your podcast slash TV, as well as good seeing you, Miss Robin. So, Robin, we're going to go to you first. Talk a little bit about Hope for Warriors, and in particular, the scope of your activities and who is affected, because it is not just those people who are enlisted and who are serving actively. It is also the whole support network, the families who provide support to those individuals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, so most of my staff are military spouses. Um, so we have all been where, you know, in the same place of um, experiencing combat at a time that, you know, really didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, we were stationed at Camp Lejeune. My husband deployed in 2003, five and seven um, with the Marine Corps. And um his best friend was very severely wounded in 2005. And so we, um, uh, 2004, excuse me. And um, so we experienced as a family, as a community, what the devastation of that can possibly be. And, you know, you rise from, uh, you just rise from the smoke when it's time. Uh, military families are very resilient. Military spouses are incredible. Um, we were faced with some pretty major challenges. And uh, so we came together as a community and said, what are we going to do to address these challenges and to make sure that we weren't just surviving? Um, because that's what was happening at that time. We were just getting by day, you know, one day at a time, um, trying to find the resources that we needed for our families in times of need um, was challenging. Uh, the military was very focused on those that were coming home wounded, rightfully so. And so there was a, some gaps in what was that family care going to look like. Um, so that's really where we started, um, in particular uh, at Camp Lejeune with spouse support groups and spouse um, scholarships were the two very first programs that we launched as we saw that need. Um, in, in particular, again, in the wounded community at that time, uh, and it's grown uh, since then. We have about 75 on staff now, and 72% uh, of our staff are either veterans or military spouses. And all of our work centers around well-being. Uh, we have mental health providers. We have um, financial advisors. We have just the gambit of uh, expertise on the staff that um, is addressing the many needs that we see. And I'm sure uh, the Sergeant Major will agree the numbers are increasing um, we've had August was the highest number of intakes we've had in 18 years. Um, so it's these kind of conversations are really important. And I truly appreciate you bringing us together to talk about them. Well, Absolutely. the thing that I think is so interesting is the number of different competencies that are that are required to allow uh, appropriate service and meet meet people where they are, mm -hmm. no matter their need. Um, Joe, could you talk a little bit about uh, your organization, talk about the Disabled Veterans National Foundation, and talk about the experience that a veteran has from intake, all from an event, all the way through to a place of, uh, of a better circumstance and of healing? Well, uh, my story is uh, pretty, pretty unique. Um, you know, my service in the military. I'm a Marine. I'm always going to be a Marine. Um, retired Sergeant Major, wounded warrior, Purple Heart recipient. I got wounded in, the, um, you know, 2004 in the Babu province. And then, of course, I went through the medevac procedures. I went through the whole medevac from uh, Germany, Walter Reed, mm -hmm. and um, Camp Lejeune, and then being back on full duty eventually, um, and then waiting for a new job. 
because I was an infantry first sergeant. So once you're wounded, they move you out to replace you. So I had the opportunity at that time to work at 2nd Marine Division, and we were collecting. They had a rear party, uh, uh, staff NCO, gunnery sergeant, lieutenant, just waiting for that wounded, ill, or injured coming back from the battlefield. And then they were due to accountability. And then, of course, we really had no network of keeping them together or providing that family support and so forth. So eventually the idea came up with creating uh, a regiment, which they did at headquarters of Marine Corps. And then of course, Battalion East and Battalion West, where wounded, ill and injured can come to an environment where they'll have recovery care coordinators, they'll have counselors, they'll have, you know, they'll have a, a small uh, military supervisor, let it be a corporal or a sergeant to make sure they get to the medical appointments and so forth, providing those resources at the military installation. Now for the horrific wounded individuals from burn units from, um, you know, uh, San Antonio, Texas for polytrauma in Tampa, Orlando, whatever the case is, we would actually move the individuals to their home of record where they would have those resources. So now we started getting a little bit bigger in terms of how we're gonna support them while they're away from their military base. And then of course we had a lot of the reserves get more involved pulled them on active duty and they were oversee, you know, their non-medical case management at that level. So I had the opportunity, well, I was given the opportunity by a phone call from General Amos one Saturday morning at Walmart collecting my milk and saying, uh, Sergeant Major, you know, we're gonna love to have you up here at the Wound Warrior Regiment. And that's how I moved into overseeing non-medical case management for wounded, ill and injured. So after my two years of, um, a little bit more than two years of serving as a regimental sergeant major. I, well, during that time, I would visit all the vet, veterans integrated service uh, networks, the VA hospitals, all throughout the United States. And I would oversee the non medical case management to make sure the families had the support, make sure the Marines were getting what they're doing or the Navy were getting uh, uh, support and so forth. But, you know, that took a, a lot of weight. You know, it was, it was very heavy on the heart to see all the carnage in the hospital as well as, you know, you leaving the battlefield. So I was transitioning out of the military. I decided to retire. I came across DVNF. They actually, I was speaking at a, a, a convention at the VFW uh, on transitional service members, and my name came up. And then the president of the DVNF um, actually asked if I can come in and take a look at their organization. And it wasn't a very good organization. They were lacking leadership, proper oversight, board governance. They were just broken. And I decided, yeah, I want this because it was broken. You know, and sergeant majors don't, don't you know, we don't like hitting home runs. You know, we want to take something that's broken and, you know, put in our leadership and, you know, build it and so forth. And I had the opportunity to do that for the last 10 years. So that's called the Disabled Veterans Nash Foundation. And, um, you know, uh, sadly, all the board of directors left and, you know, all new staff. So I had to rebuild a new business plan for the nonprofit to include mental health, by the way. We do have a program called Mission Possible with Dr. Marty Rosman, which is a good friend of mine in California on mind, body, and spirit. And we have a free class that you can actually download. It's a self-paced and you get a digital download of, uh, of, of books and so forth, as well as your own dashboard, as well as, uh, um, you know, your journals and so forth. And we have a Mission Possible podcast where I would bring a nonprofit on that's doing great within the community. I may bless them ten thousand dollars at the end of that uh, that podcast. So we've been doing that for the last six months, just to get the notoriety of what mindfulness is and mental health and where it's needed because we're lacking um, resiliency, sadly. And then, of course, we have a national job board. We're partnered with Montel Williams. We built a national job board, which we have more than 700,000 jobs that are posted on our, our job board on our website. Organically, by the way, we're not uh, charging any of this. So we're actually outpacing a lot of these job boards they are paying a lot of money for. And we also have an honor wall, you know, where we can place a pledge and so forth in honor memory of a loved one or, you know, someone that has fallen by wayside. And we also have a wonderful program that we just started. And I think Robin may like this. It's called a Veterans Food Assistant Program. Our new fiscal started this October. I put $150,000 in this pilot program and we were depleted within eight days. First eight days, we depleted. So they would actually do an application online. I'd have a VFAP uh, uh, um, program person answer a phone and we'll do a budget and make see where the shortfall was. And we'll take an application in terms of what groceries they need. And we do the order and form and they get 
the food gets delivered to them. So they're not going to the food bank. It's all private. They can either pick it up, we have it delivered, and we're out of money. So we tell, I mean, that's where the insecurity is right now is within food. Mental health and food is definitely, um, uh, uh, you know, it's on a rise, sadly. So we're out, we're out of money. You know, we're out of money just for that pilot program. That just tells you where the need is. You know, so that this, I'll take the data from that. I'll create a dashboard and, you know, uh, create some type of a, 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 a marketing and narrative. And hopefully we can get some sponsors to support this. You know, we all know what I find to be so interested, interesting, Joe, is this, again, the, the, the range of competencies and partnerships that you are describing, mm -hmm. you're doing it so fluidly. But as, as I'm looking at it, as somebody who recruits these folks, right, I'm thinking, well, we have technical competencies, we have logistical competencies, Absolutely. we have mental health treatment competencies, right, Robin? We've got, we've got uh, issues of physical health. We've got issues of where you live, homelessness, mm -hmm. right? You are talking about a team that is responding across a whole broad range of needs, right. And then yep. there's, there's something else that you did, which I thought was interesting and I think deserves a lot of attention. It's the navigation of identity mm -hmm. throughout. You're a retired Sergeant Major. You will always be a Marine. You're also Joe. Absolutely. You're also the vigorous soldier. You're also the wounded warrior. You're also a friend. You're also the compassionate person who is looking down at yourself in a sense, because you've held both identities as you have uh, gone through your recovery. This idea of navigating identity, finding yourself is part of what you're doing, aren't you? Wow. It's a it, it's a it, it's a big it's a big issue, isn't it? I mean, for Robin, for for a spouse, they're they're finding themselves. It's it's yeah. emotional. It's yeah. emotional. That is part of that's most probably one of the most difficult parts of all of this is because transition. There's such great emphasis and energy put on building an identity in the military. You know who you are. You know who's standing beside you, behind you, and in front of you. The transition out becomes, to in my my impression, is more technical. Like these are like this is the suit you should wear, but that right. doesn't say who you are in that suit. Right. You now have a new identity journey that isn't got that ha doesn't have that much energy placed on it by anyone. It's now you're doing it all by yourself. Um, Absolutely, and, and you know you hit an emotional spot on me because. I always, I mean, I was institutionalized. I mean, if you think about it, you know, 27 years of some change, you know, you, um, you know, uh, you get, you know, you started drinking the Jim Jones Kool-Aid, if you want to call it that. And I apologize for using that term, but, you know, you, you get institutionalized on structure, you get in institutionalized on family, you know, because your military is your family, brothers, sisters, and so forth, you know, and, and it's, so you kind of like lose Joe a little bit, you know, and I became a Sergeant Major. Right. So now that I'm out of the military, I'm still trying to find Joe, honestly. So you hit a note there with me. It's emotional because, you know, I know what I, I know what my capabilities are in the military. You know, I was an overachiever. I did well and so forth, you know, but here I am in the civilian world, right, with the sergeant major mentality and all. You know, I work with civilians, my deputy directors, you know, my CFO and so forth. And and I'm somewhat demanding at some point, you know, but then again, you know, um, I no longer have that def no defect mentality, right? So I have to allow things that fall by wayside because that's just nature in, in terms. But in the military, you can't make or can't have that flaw because someone can die, someone can get hurt. You know, but yes, I've been trying to find myself and I, and I have, and I'm trying to develop myself from, you know, how I speak, you know, how I treat others, not saying I treat them bad, uh, but, you know, um, I don't say please in the military. Right. Um, you just ask and you yeah, it's it's it, right. it's tough. Exactly. It's tough to shift and it's tough to get yeah. out of your own head and your own socialization, no matter what the situation is. It really requires a type of courage mm -hmm. to confront yourself 
and to make that change and to say, okay, all these things that I learned, they might be valuable, but I'm operating in a different context. I have more to learn and I have more to teach. I have more to share. It's it's both a, a source of vulnerability and strength, isn't it? Right? Well, there, there's definitely weakness and strength in both parts right there, but I look at the strength aspect of it. You know, I mean, you know, she knows this. We do, you know, you're up at five in the morning, you're you're back home at, you know, six, seven, especially if you're leader, sometimes twenty hundred at night, eight o'clock at night. But the way I think is there's not a there's you know, there's not a problem that I I, I feel I cannot solve. I think that all challenges in life can be managed, right? And then of course you work towards solving them. I had to learn a lot. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I have a few degrees and so forth. I'm educated, right? But when you when you when I look at a nonprofit, I don't look just as a nonprofit. You know, a lot of nonprofits have more red tape than there is than than an <laughs> LLC. Trust me, and Robin knows this. From joint cost allocations to pro- programs to programs, and so, I mean, it's just there's a lot involved from fundraising costs and so forth, compliance salary, requirements, abs- right? Absolutely. Then you got to look at the matrix of a, of a program. You know, you know the impact. How are you going to capture the impact? You know, everything needs to be uh, aligned to serving veterans. You can't give things away without receiving something. That's just the bottom line. Keep on giving it away. What are your donors going to say? Where's the impact? You know, there's so much involved within the nucleus of running a nonprofit than you can imagine. It's, that's just a fact, and especially if you do it properly. And that's what I'm trying to do. So we're trying to create programs, right? What, what is the landscape t- saying today, right? And I know Rob, food and security, right? We have a homeless to housing program. In other right. words, we, we fund uh, veterans uh, that's transitioning from homelessness to housing and we'll pay you know up to two thousand dollars for that one individual to help them get into a home up right? to two thousand dollars to help yes. make, make that transition into yes. being housed yes and then we also have a program called grass provide stability so the ones that are in homes that cannot pay their rent or electricity or gas bill or, or mortgage will pay for them directly not to them to the provider so that's called our grants provide stability to keep them in a house homeless to housing to get them in the house. And then we just piloted a program, which we ran out of money for testing 150,000 less than eight days, you know, veterans food assistance program to put food on their table. So now we close that little gap of where the need is from what the economic landscape is actually telling us right now, right? And then of course, mental health, mission possible, insecurity of jobs, job board. So that's how I look at it. So we adjust our operational tempo due to what the landscape is telling us and the data is telling us. So Robin spoke earlier about what the data is telling us. So we have to pay attention to what's happening out there on the ground, nationally, by the way. And and Robin, in terms of your programs, could you uh, just sort of unpack some of the details of the programs? This this food program is is so interesting because Joe just described a prototype, sort of a proof of concept, and basically was, was just... A, uh, Joe, am I, am, I, am I expressing this right? A little stunned about how quickly that well, needed. I was, into, I was hoping to at least get through three months with it. Uh, we just put up yesterday that we're no longer accepting applications. We have over 280 applications right now. So if you're averaging about you know 500 to 600 dollars per veteran in terms of food insecurity, and we purchase those foods for them and get it delivered. I'm depleted. So we had to shut that down, anticipating that all these applications will be proved. You uh-huh. know, so so now I, you know, I go to my board of directors, okay, the pilot program grabbed legs and ran on us. This is gonna be the next direction that we need to take to fulfill the VFAP so we can continue to take applications. But you're absolutely right. I wasn't anticipating it, but I knew it was gonna move quick on us. Robin, what, what what kind of programs do you find that are that are uh, generating the most need and the most response from your organization? Um, right now, the, we're very similar in that we have um, so we've done we've done a number of food distributions across the country in, in as a response to hurricanes, uh, natural disasters, um, which then became a, an annual. Um, opportunity for us to reach out into communities of need and make sure that people know what the resources are for them. So a great example, last year, we did a food drive at Fort Campbell. 
And we had 4,000 families show up for a box of food. 4,000 families? You don't even have to survey them. If they're sitting in line for a box of food, there's food Absolutely. insecurity in that family. It is 4,000? 4,000. Absolutely. What was what's remarkable uh, about the the food distribution is that it can't be a one and done, right? So there's there's information in the box. There's um, there's a QR code in the box that says, "Here's what you know. Contact us for what comes next because you are in need." And that's and that's okay because the economy's rough and military families are making tough decisions right now. But what I wanted to be really clear about is. The needs that we're seeing are not necessarily dissimilar to other pockets of populations, you know, in our country. We just have them all kind of in one population. So what we're learning is so important for lessons learned, best practices for other organizations that are serving other populations and even the general population. Mental health is is not exclusive to the military. We just learned a lot more, a lot faster. Um, but the food piece is so important. And I think what people need to understand is when you're making decisions for your family, because perhaps your rent or your mortgage has gone up and you can no, no longer live there, which means you move further and further away from where you work, which then requires more gas in order to get to work, you're starting to make decisions for, for your family that affect their well-being. And Absolutely. if food, it, if healthy food is the most expensive food out there and you're making choices for the family, then you're feeding them probably less healthy food. That's what, that's what our clients are telling us. It is affecting the well-being of the military family, which is a matter of national security. So it's a big, crazy loop. Um, but what I think is so important to hear is that there's so many good organizations like the two of ours that are out there really doing the work. And that's unique in this country. So it's really important to know, and especially for those young people that are considering military service, it there's been unfortunate, you know, pictures painted about what the military looks like these days. They're homeless. They're food insecure. They're wounded. They're broken. That's not no. the truth. Yeah, I, we we have to counter that narrative. I mean, we have to counter. I think your your framing, Robin, is is perfect. It's it's a reflection of American society, right? There are some special circumstances, but the military and and its veterans are not broken. Mark, fact, you're absolutely the military right. and its veterans are solving this problem, right? Absolutely, 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 Mark. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt him, but you're, you're definitely on target there, Robin. Because here's the thing, though, right? Less than one percent of our American population serves our military. Less than 1%, period. I can't take care of populace, right? You have HUD that takes care of homelessness, which you have to get a voucher to wait for and, and because it's funded. So so HUD, you know, it's a federal, you know, federal then, you know, a state program, whatever the case is, you know, with, and then of course they use nonprofits to help feed the fund, I mean the HUD. And when they run out of money, you know, you're not liable. You mean can't get a you know can't get a certificate of housing. What it does, it offsets your you know income to pay for uh, the rent and so forth. So that's a problem. So if you look at populace, right, we're less than one percent. We're talking about one percent, and you have the whole populace out there with the migration. Uh, uh, you know, it's 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 putting a lot of uh, stress on our social services, right? And we have military folks, active duty military folks, utilizing social services. You know, our our Lance Corporal's PFCs and so forth, are, they're, they're making less than minimum wage or minimum wage. Imagine that, fighting our country and so forth. And they're on food stamps and, and so forth. Right. So remember, we're less than 1%. And by the way, uh, service members, we're not broken. We're not broken. Right. We have issues. We have life challenges like any individual in our country. Right. We're just a small sliver. And it takes, you know, organizations like Robin, organizations like DVNF and so forth to come together Right, and attack that one or that less less than one percentage, and that's what we're doing right now. You know, they they have this this mindset out there, not mindset, but it's a soundbite they utilize. We exist as nonprofits to fill the gap. No, we don't. Or I know the VA. The VA does wonderful things. They're just bottlenecked. All right. Uh, I remember being an active duty individual. I didn't have to wait in line for medical. Now I have to wait in line because I'm a veteran. 
They're bottlenecked and they provide wonderful services, but you just wait in the line. That's just the bottom line. So well, you know, I think that, that yeah. what you do, Joe, and what you do, Robin, is you basically challenge these bottlenecks, yeah. right? You're not sure. going to solve them. You're not a silver bullet. You're not going, it, it, it's, it, 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 it's not easy. And you pointed out, Joe, and you pointed out, Robin, that the challenges shift with time, right? Mm -hmm. Needs change. But I think what you're doing is you're challenging the impediments to solutions, and you're offering some solutions of your of your own. You're testing them. You're you gathered intelligence, right? You did a foray into a need with your hundred and fifty thousand dollar investment, and you were surprised how great the need was. Now you've got intel that you can share with other people, and other people Absolutely. will be galvanized to respond with you. They might have different expertise. They might come from a different area. But now informed by your experience, they can use that to, to shape their own response. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you have to create, I mean, if you're going to have a program, you got to have a proof of concept. You got to have a data. So you got to let the program run, mm -hmm. let the money run out. You know, then you look at what branches of service, location, locality of it, size of the family. I mean, it's just, and then you pull the data back and it's, it's going to give you a picture. It's going to give you a narrative. Then you take that narrative and say, this is the problem. So, right. you know, we know where the problem is. We're just enhancing it. You know, we're just putting that billboard up over that problem. Like, hey, get guys, guess what? You know, this program works here. That program works there. How about funding it? State, federal, private and so forth. Fund it. Can I talk a little bit about, about those who are really affected and who are really helped by your work who we haven't mentioned yet and that is children of military families because the children of military families who um, are more likely to enlist in the future than citizens who are not connected to military families those children are the people who are there they're not so obviously affected in the immediate uh, moment, but those effects are so deep and so long lasting. Um, how do you both look at the services that you provide in terms of affecting the family members, particularly young children who are not necessarily able to process that mom or dad has been wounded, that mom and dad might be suffering from, from stress in certain ways, um, how do you how do you deal with that? And please, you know, either either one of you just hold for it. Um, I'll share that we um, very proud of one program that we have is our is our clinic in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And at this at this time, the percentage of military kids coming into that clinic is is increasing significantly. And the reason why one is the only. Um, resource, mental health resource, behavioral health resource for military kids in all of Eastern North Carolina. And I have four right now um, clinicians trained in what's called parent-child interactive training. And it's a, it's a unique um, modality to work with military kids, but also to bring back the, bring the military family back together. They're the only four in all of Eastern North Carolina that are doing that work. Um, so we, we, Dig in, we do the work, but we're also a voice for this has to change. It cannot remain this way. Military kids, like you said, uh, have been serving alongside their parents. Um, they're the kind of the silent warrior. Um, sometimes they don't even identify as military kids once their parents get out. Um, and that's a shame because I think people should listen to their stories um, and they should share what their experiences have been. Um, <clears throat> because they are interesting and unique, uh, but they need to be celebrated more. And we need to we need to have a greater conversation about military kids. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up. It's um, the suicide rate of military children is much higher than the general public as it is with female veterans. So these are really important conversations that need to take place. Yeah, but you, you got to peel the onion back on that as well. So, you know, and not every military child is fallen by wayside. But, you know, if the mother or father is serving and then they have remnants of post-traumatic stress, of course, the family, you know, they absorb, you know, a lot of that 
external emotions from that individual, you know, and PTSD creeps up on you. I got PTSD. I've been blown up, shot at or whatever. PTSD is nothing new. We all have it in one form or another. Let it be a car accident or we see something horrific for the first time. Something that sticks with you for a little while and, you know, becomes a scab, becomes a scar. You know, and then sometimes um, something may remind you of that. Let it be a smell or something, you know. But yes, I believe that if the mother or father that serve in the military and they're in that environment and they absorb something new and so forth, it changes their personality because they're learning to deal with it. Or like the military says, you know, complacency kills. In other words, I'm in combat. We had a wounded individual, someone that was killed or whatever. You know, our focus on cleaning our weapons, get back out on patrol. You know, the sergeant made the first sergeant takes care of the wounded and so forth, and we'll deal with that aspect. We want their mindset in the game. But when they get home and they're not running 90 miles an hour, what happens? They're running 35 miles an hour, right? They're on, on, on vacation or leave or whatever, and then they start getting complacent. And then PTSD starts creeping up. And then the remnants of that, the carnage that they absorbed, reflects on their wife, their husband, and their children. And yes, it does have an effect. Because your children, first of all, they miss you. You know, they love you. And they worry about you. So, yes, I, I believe that that uh, there's a lot of um, unsurfaced issues with military children that is not brought, you know, brought to the horizon. Uh, I, I do have that in our Mission Possible um, program where it's military members, first responders and family members to can actually sign up for free. We have more than 3,162 registered users, and our Mission Possible program is only less than two years old. And this is free. This is all free. It's always going to be free for every service member that served our country to keep us free. So that's what I like. I like to provide a service and a program as a nonprofit organization, vice sadly putting up a burn victim and asking for donations. Show the program, show the services, let's show the impact. You know, then hopefully the donations come in to support that concept of operations. But children should be at the forefront of this as well, because, you know, they need that resiliency. They need that, you know, we, we have to, um, you know, refurbish our children at some point because the resiliency is not with our young adults right now. They don't have the resiliency. They're not problem solving. I don't know how they skip that. You know, I grew up problem solving, you know, uh, you know, three TV channels, 10, 13 and six. One telephone, right, with a 30-foot cord, right? Everybody played outside. No Atari, no nothing, no digital. Now right. it's just, will you be my friend? Putting everything on social media. So so that plays an effect on emotions and so forth. Anxiety is very high right now in the military for our children because the deployment ratio, right? And now we're getting ramped back up with what's happening overseas right now and that's that becomes a stress just knowing that your family is working up and you know that your dad and mom's going to get deployed or they're working up to get deployed children know and they're smart you know and uh yeah, but you're absolutely right though i think we need a little bit more you know it's it's easy to create a program but getting them to that door and have them operate through that that takes talent that's where the counselors come in you know that's where the experts and and the military is so fabulous in certain respects in terms of, of finding personnel within the ranks who can address some of these issues, both after um, people leave the military, but also when they're within the military. So we benefited, for example, uh, during the Bosnia deployment with uh, our kids went to a preschool and school uh, with some fabulous, fabulous educators that came directly out of the U.S. Army. And uh, they were just amazing. And watching them deal with all these different kids coming from different stages of whatever they were experiencing that you were describing, Joe, was was uh, just amazing. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. So, Robin, if you could take us out in terms of what you feel the United States and every citizen needs to do next to to help in addressing some of the needs that that Joe has described so eloquently uh, what would that be what would you how would you want us to think how do you want me to think I'm so I my family uh, has a military background I have not served 
how should I be thinking? How should I be acting? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking, because as we talked about through this program, the nonprofits that are doing this work are critical to the, the end state of this mission. Mm -hmm. And we are challenging the narrative. We're challenging the institutional pieces that are in place. Um, we're enhancing and reinforcing the support systems and resources for military families. We are showing the rest of the world what it looks like to problem solve for different populations. Um, and as a reminder, the, you know, the U.S. military is the most diverse workforce in the entire world. So we're working with, you know, all kinds of different families, and but we're creating solutions and the the amount of work that we do to support our our clients and our service members and their families has it has has to be funded and so it is it's really important for individuals companies foundations to recognize that not only are you funding programs but you're also creating a force multiplier by recognizing Absolutely. that our solutions are applicable across the general population and therefore, it, it's worth the investment. Um, it's worth the time and energy to take a look at what we're doing and see where you as an individual can either volunteer or donate your time, treasure, and talent. That is a great way to, to uh, it's a great thought to, to end with, that no matter how small or how large, it's a contribution. So con contribute, contribute, be part of this, be part of this movement to solve these issues I'd like to thank you, Joe uh, Van Fonda, so, uh, Sergeant Major Retired of the U.S. Marine Corps and CEO of the Disabled Veterans National Foundation, and you, Robin Kelleher, CEO and co-founder of the Hope for the Warriors. It is just so wonderful to be educated by you, and it is humbling. Thank you so much for how you serve, who you serve, and please thank all of your constituents, all of your staff, your donors, your boards, those people who receive your service who are part of the solution and will go on to serve further their colleagues. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, wonderful, Mark. Thanks for having me.